I start. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sean, for joining me. Let's see. Okay. So yeah, I suppose we'll dive right into it. So what, <clears throat> what kind of experience do you have um, work-wise and business-wise with digital employees? Yeah, so I've started several companies in the past, and they all worked with people exclusively that were not in the same physical location as me. So, okay. Okay. Nice. So, what, what, um, what? If you take one of the businesses, what, what kind of, um, what kind of roles did your digital employees have? <laughs> Uh, so in the first one, they were providing like uh, content writing, um, economics. So we were, we were doing uh, blockchain services. Okay. So they were doing like white paper development, articles, community development, community management. Um, yeah, these kinds of things. Okay. Okay. Really nice. So how long ago was it when you first, when you first started? Uh, this company was in 2016 and I stopped in 2018. So it's okay. about two years to your time. Okay. Okay. Really nice. And what, what was the first company that you ever started with like digital employees? That one. Oh, that one. Okay. Okay. Nice. So, and what was your experience compared if you had, uh, other businesses before, um, what, what were the different like main differences between working with a digital team compared to like a for say in-house team or working by yourself and a partner? Well, having a team that doesn't have to see you physically ever means that you can wear whatever you want whenever you want and, and work whenever you <laughs> want and work wherever you want. And you know. Yeah. My, basically my my philosophy is I want complete freedom. And if I have a physical office, I lose all of that freedom. Okay. Okay. I see. Nice. Yeah, it's a good good model. Um <clears throat> so what uh what were like would you say the main difficulties when starting working with digital employees? What were like some of the difficulties that you encountered? Um well it's hard to say because it depends on the mentality of of the person, mm -hmm. right? So okay, I, I I have a podcast. I've interviewed many, I mean, like over 150 um, company owners. And some okay. of them won't go remote because they're afraid they're not going to be able to see the quality of the person's work. Okay. For someone like me, my philosophy is the opposite. I don't need to see you working. I just need to see that it got done. So hmm. if you commit to doing something by a certain time and you get it done and the quality is there, I don't care if it took you 10 hours or one. And I don't care if you did it at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. And right. I don't care if you did it in front of a beach, in front of a pool, at the movies. I don't care where you do it. But I think I may be a very open-minded person in this regard compared to some other founders I've spoken to. Yeah, I, su yeah, I suppose <clears throat> as the, the, the other founders you mentioned, I suppose that's a bit more of the traditional way of working and like running a company, mm -hmm. I suppose um this the 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 mindset you have right now I, I at least from from my perspective i would say that it seems more futuristic um more as you say open-minded um definitely yeah and and i go a step further where i don't pay people hourly i pay them a salary for, for okay. the month okay so if, if people are working hourly they're incentivized to work as slowly as possible yeah <laughs> right but if they're on a salary, they're incentivized to get the job done well, because if they do, they got a job the next month. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Really nice. So do you, are you currently working with any digital employees? Um, currently, no. Okay. I, I shut that company down in 2018. Okay. I started another company right after. Mm -hmm. I had 15, 16 employees for that company at one point. And because of my oh. investors, I had to shut oh, that company hundred percent remote. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and because of my investors being investors, I didn't get all the money that was promised to me in a timely fashion. And I had to shut that down in oh. August. Um, and so I haven't had any, well, after that, I, I did have two full-time um, digital employees for my podcast but one of them disappeared 
so I decided not to replace him. Oh. And then the other one, uh, like he basically did what I hired him to do. And then uh, there was nothing left that I could have him do. So I let him go. Okay. Um, and so for the last four or five months, I haven't had anyone. Although I am probably today going to start looking to hire uh, another uh, video editor. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, <clears throat> really nice. So what, what kind of like, was there someone or some other company that like inspired you to hire digitally at your first company or did you just like no. find the idea yourself? Um, I just, I knew that I really didn't want to work in an office anymore and I, I wanted to be free to, so it, it, it's a little more complicated than that. So at the time uh, of the last job that I had, um, working in an office, I was fired because I got into an accident and I couldn't work so well. Okay. And at that moment, I said to myself, I'm never going to work for anyone else again. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I said, I don't want to be reliant on any individual economy for money. Right. Because at the time I was working in China, earning Chinese yuan. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to continue living in China, I would have to make money from Chinese businesses. And I knew that that wasn't a really good way forward for myself because I really wanted the flexibility to travel wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And mm -hmm. the only way to do that was to be able to have a business that I could earn money from anyone, anywhere at any time. And in doing so, I decided that I would only ever run companies that were digital so that I would never have to have a physical location anywhere so that I could always be available to serve customers in different countries. So it was kind of a, this, a, a philosophy for a lifestyle that created the mentality. Wow. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, <clears throat> so right now you, you, you mentioned you have, you have a podcast. Do you, what, what other business do you run? Do you run another business at the moment? So the, that tech company that shut down is technically, it's not just on pause kind of, cause like the investor came back and he's like, yeah, I've got the money ready. Let's go. Uh -huh. um, so I said, all right, well pay me everything that you owe me. And then get me a new investor because the money you owe me isn't enough to relaunch. So as far as I'm concerned, the company is still alive, but it's it's on pause. So um, that company is still in the air, but like we've paid for the filing and everything. So like the company is legally active. Mm -hmm. The structure exists, but there's just no operations at the moment. Okay. Um, and then the podcast itself, um, I'm turning into a business. Mm -hmm. Um. And then I'm also uh, consulting with some companies and helping them with things like uh, their payment processing and their operations and cost reductions. And um, there's a company I just invested in that does liquidation. So I'm going to be working with them to build out some of their processes and help them to scale their operations so that they can um, you know, be as large as they possibly can because liquidation is insane. Um, so yeah, a little bit of like my own stuff, a little bit of like investing in other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, nice. Um, <clears throat> so in in the tech industry, how how common would you say it is to outsource like in your in, in the industry? Like how common is it to outsource like to 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 developing countries um to get work done? So there's a difference between outsourcing to other countries and hiring people full time. Mm -hmm. to work for you but they're remote and ha may happen to be in one of those developing countries right okay so um can you clarify for me which you want me to to talk about i think the i think the main one would be um <clears throat> i think the main one would be hiring full-time remote as you said and then yes it can happen that they're in a in a developing economy um but if if yeah hiring full time like how common would you say that is like on a remote base i would say covid caused it to become much more common yeah okay yeah i it, it also it depends on the kind of business mm -hmm. you know like before covid remote work was seen as like beneath in in office work and i think there's some companies that still hold that mentality where it's like, oh, we have someone teleconferencing, right? We've got someone calling in from somewhere else. And like that person isn't really seen. They're not really heard. It feels different. But in a 
in a company where everyone is remote, everyone only sees each other on these cameras. And so everyone has equal opportunity. Mm. Um, and so I, I think that's a really good way because then nobody really feels left out because everyone is equal in that regard. I think, I think working remote allows you to flatten your hierarchy, flatten the structure of the company and do it in a way that, you know, the, the people at the top are far more accessible than normal to all of the other people that are working. Um, uh, I, I, I know I didn't hit your, your actual question though, so I'll try to reach oh, that. That's still, that. That's still good, good input. What you said. Um, I would say it's far more common now after COVID to be able to hire people. And I think a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking at other countries, um, depending on what kind of a business they're doing. The reason being is you might be doing something that only serves Americans and you might be afraid that someone in India won't understand the American mentality and therefore it might be hard. I mean, again, it, it depends on what kind of business they're doing, what mm -hmm. area, what geographical region they're focusing on, if they are focusing on one. And then what is the position of the person that they're trying to hire, right? So you can hire a bunch of Indians and Filipinos to do your um, development work and your software testing work right but you may not want to hire them to do your sales and your marketing if you're targeting a north american audience mm -hmm. because they may not have the cultural understanding to be able to fulfill that role so you may have this hybrid globalized system where you have people from all over the world performing different functions based on you know what they can do mm -hmm. and what what is is right for the company um, so for example, in my startup, all of our testers and developers were from the Philippines and India and our, um, our marketing director was from Greece and we only hired him, I mean, we hired him for many reasons, but one of the reasons we hired him was he had a cultural understanding of the West and he had worked for, you know, Dutch companies mm -hmm. and he helped you know, some companies expand into the UAE, which we weren't really targeting the UAE, but he had experience with expansion into other markets, which we found to be valuable. Um, you know, so I probably wouldn't have hired someone from Indonesia mm. or, or New Zealand to target, you know, a European market right. or, or North American market. So there's a lot of nuance to, um, what you're doing mm -hmm. in, in terms of then making that decision of what kind of a person you want to hire, where are they from? Um, right. And one of the reasons there, there's also two reasons why you would hire um, outside of those normal Western spheres. And that's mostly because it costs a lot less to do so. Yeah. So, um, you know, it just depends on, on a lot of those factors and a lot of them are personal psychological you know, mm -hmm. uh, beliefs held by the founders. Okay. And <clears throat> this is a bit of a similar question. It just towards the other direction, as you mentioned earlier, um, since you have a lot of experience working with a lot of big companies um, and talking to a lot of big companies, like on your podcast, for example, um, would you say that it's common to out, like not to hire full-time remote, but to outsource to developing economies? Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a number of different kinds of outsourcing that people can do. And again, it goes to the mentality of the founder where some will say, I've only got $10,000 and I don't have the in-house technology, uh, the in-house uh, understanding of how to build this MVP. So I'm gonna spend that 10,000, I'll give it to a team in Ukraine. I'll let them build my MVP, I'll get users I'll get investors and then I'll tear it apart, start again fr uh, fresh with a team in Silicon Valley. Um, there's other people like myself that said, I'm going to, I don't have the knowledge, but I have the money. So I'm going to build the team. I'm going to let them develop the MVP and I'm going to raise more money and then I'm going to pay them more and I'm going to have them keep developing. Um, you know, there, there's different, you can outsource anything from mm -hmm. your business. The problem is when you outsource, you're putting yourself in a position where you really don't have control over the quality because that oftentimes you, 
don't have the understanding and the expertise to know if the quality of the work or the cost for the work is correct. Um, and then you're also still dealing with the um, cultural differences of the people that are running that agency. And I've had positive experiences and I've had negative experiences with outsourcing, but the one thing I never outsourced and will never outsource is tech. Okay. okay. I outsourced the branding. I outsourced um, uh, design at, for, for the beginning, uh, but tech was something I would never outsource. That's just my personal philosophy, but I've heard of people that outsource the tech and they're happy with it. But my, my thought process is if you're outsourcing that thing, it means you don't understand it. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's fine. But if you don't understand how your tech works, then that's like asking for a disaster. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. So, um, about about your previous company, the the blockchain services company, um, how big of an impact would you say the digital your digital team had on the business? I couldn't run it without them. Yeah. Okay. They were they were the ones that were providing the services to the clients. I was basically doing the marketing and the sales and the project management. Okay. Right. Okay. So I, I would, I would find them, I would sell them and then I would have the team, you know, do the the actual the servicing of the clients. And I would just make sure that they were doing it and communicate with the clients. So, you know, without them, I, I couldn't have provided those services because I didn't have the expertise to do it. I knew enough that they were doing a quality job. And that I could defend the quality of their job if the client pushed back. Okay. But um, but I, I didn't have enough expertise to actually execute it myself. And if I did, it would have been a waste of my time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. So <clears throat> just touching a bit on what you just said as well. Um, what kind of strategies or how can I say processes did you put in place to like retain digital employees like long-term to get them to like stick and stay with your company? Well, like I said, I don't care where you work or when you work or how you work. All I care is you commit to something, you get it done and it's profitable. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a, that's a really cool mentality actually from a business, from a business owner, I would say. Um, that's really nice. Okay. So, one other a bit of a different um because i'm i'm sure you know as you've had a lot of experience with different companies and agencies what would you say like the future of the agency business model would look like in 10 years i think agencies will be a lot more decentralized mm -hmm. and i think the employees will have a lot more equitable control over how it's run and where the profit goes. I know of one such uh, company, they don't call themselves an agency, but in essence, they're they're like a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And um, they have this really unique way of doing things that uh, just blows my mind. And it started out of this mentality from the founder that he wanted an anti-company. He was so tired of building companies. He had built and sold multiple companies, but he was so tired of them that he just didn't want to have another company. And he ended up building a company that wasn't a company. Okay. And, and they last I talked with him uh, about seven, eight, nine months ago, they were grossing nearly four hundred thousand dollars a month. I'd say. Wow. But the way that they do it is, um, there's a formula that they. Hello. Sean? Hello? Okay, just for the recording, Sean has had a internet issue. He will rejoin shortly. <clears throat> 